this time I'll call our special meeting to order. I'd like to ask Commissioner Legg to lead us in our invocation, which will be followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. If you will, all please stand. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to together here this evening to do the business of the town. We ask that you help us go through this agenda process and the ordinances and to make the right decision for what is best for the town. We thank you for all of our town employees and our staff, our first responders. We ask God that you keep them safe and watch over each and every one of them and watch over us and guide us back to our homes this evening. We ask that you bless those and heal those who are not healthy tonight, Lord, and that we can again have a, a joyful time in their presence. We never fail to give you the praise in your name. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag, the flag of the United States, States, of, America States of America and, and to, to the republic, republic for which it stands, one, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You may be seated. All right, we are tonight. We're going to be looking at the uh, subdivision ordinance. Thank you. And you do have that in front of you. What I'll do is turn this over to Mr. McLaughlin. All right. Um, and uh, just in full disclosure, um, you'll see I kind of picked up where uh, our previous board left off uh, with some uh, ideas that I have. But I definitely want to get um, a chance to give you guys a, um, an opportunity to give me um, some areas that you want to concentrate on as well. Now, in terms of where we are now, um, we conducted our last work session in 2019, um, and it was tied to um, amendments to the tree preservation section of the zoning ordinance. But under that, even though the tree preservation section of the zoning ordinance is not the subdivision ordinance, many of the things we're trying to achieve are tied to the subdivision of land, commercial and residential. Um, in that work session, um, we never really moved forward with the tree preservation piece, but I did introduce a section that I wanted to focus on that it relates to landscaping requirements. Um, those three areas related um, tied to focused on yard space, off street parking areas, and streetscape provisions. So that's where I'm going to pretty much set the basis of this particular work session with, and then you'll see um, how it can kind of go into the subdivision ordinance or at least give you an uh, opportunity to provide some more direction on other sections. In terms of current issues that I just see in general in Hope Mills, like I said, some of them may be in the zoning ordinance, but they are related to what I consider the subdivision or development of land. Areas of concern as of right now for commercial developments or landscaping at the street level, and I'll go into detail on in each one of these. Landscaping around building envelopes, landscaping and parking areas, and for residential, the caliper size of a tree, that's basically the diameter of the actual tree trunk um, in um, landscape architecture, where we call it the caliper. Um, also, I want to delve into some cross references with other ordinances that I want to put in, make a part of these amendments as well. All right, so let's get started. In terms of commercial, commercial development, and we're talking about landscaping at street level, we're talking about section 102A-1202N2A in terms of the landscaping section. This is not in the, the subdivision ordinance. I'm talking out of the zoning ordinance right now. Um, this is in the streetscape provisions. Now, part of that cross-referencing is that in our zoning ordinance, we do list specific landscape requirements. But what I found out is there are no landscape requirements in the subdivision ordinance directly. That's some of the stuff I'm, I'm here to kind of work on. Um, but in regards to why I think this is crucial, I have an example I, got, I want you guys to uh, look after this meeting. I want you to look at the Circle K on the intersection of Cumberland and uh, Hope Mills Road. And I want you to drive all the way down outside of Hope Mills to that Circle K on Glens Ford and Hope Mills Road. Look at just the landscaping. And what you're going to see is almost triple 
the amount of vegetative landscaping and trees and things of that nature and as a landscape architecture uh, tech that's what i like to see the landscaping of a development does enhance it to make it a lot more beautiful i think we could do that here so what you see in some of these there's three sections that a development of hope mills has to actually meet with respect to landscaping the street level is along the street in the setback area what you'll see in the next section is the street yard which is basically inside the building envelope and then you have um parking um landscaping requirements that are tied to the parking areas every property that's commercial has to meet all three of those so even though it's three different sections on the same site you have to meet landscaping requirements as compared to fedville we are still well below what i think could be a reasonable increase in landscaping requirements and as you recall i'm always a proponent for businesses i do not want to push in a direction where you're negatively impacting businesses but what i'm proposing here is what i think is a a happy medium of increasing our landscaping requirements but not to the point where it alters um the ability of a, of a commercial development to, to actually have some revenue so the current language you see in the section of the code that relates to streetscape provisions one shade trees require in the front yard setback at 10 feet in height or you can do three flowering ornamental trees per each 50 linear feet of street frontage what you see and i'm proposing i'm proposing to double that Doubling sounds like a lot, but it's really not that much to me as it relates to what I want to see achieved because that's why I want you to do that study. When you see that Circle K or all the ones in Fayetteville, you can see the landscaping is healthier. It's larger at the time of installation. So that's some of the things I'm trying to do. So for what I'm proposing in the streetscape provision is just to double that. So instead of one shade tree, you have two. If you want to do ornamental flowering trees as opposed to a shade tree, you have to do six now as opposed to three. Um, the same linear f um, feet is there, but it's basically taking that requirement and making it um, twice as uh, stringent. <clears throat> that same ideology applies to what I call the yard space. Now, that's also dis defined as the building envelope, like I said before. Landscaping in this area must be installed in the building areas adjacent to the public street. Required plant materials must be located between the structure and the setback. So the previous street um, section here is from street to setback line. When you have in the building envelope, it's where the setback line is through the lot to the building. So we call that the building envelope. The current language requires, and this is section 102A, 1202 N2B, yard space and the zoning ordinance. The current language requires one ornamental tree for every 50 feet of the building length and or width and two shrubs for every 10 linear feet of building length and or width. As um, same ideology applies, I want to double that requirement. So instead of one ornamental tree, you have to have two. So based on whatever your tree count is for that 50 foot of building length, you're now having to do double that um, as opposed to what's required now. And again, our third area is parking areas. So the current language um, requires one tree, um, a minimum of eight feet in height, and six shrubs at least 18 inches in height for every 15 spaces. Now you'd be required to do two trees at 10 feet in height. I want the trees a little higher. And you're now required to do 12 shrubs for every 15 spaces. Now, um, as I stated earlier, what you currently have, and I, I found this to be very interesting because every residential subdivision that you see, they have that, I call them twigs, it's that little twig they put in the front yard. It was very interesting to find out that's not a requirement. There are no landscaping requirements in the subdivision on this. I think there should be. So what I'm doing, they're already putting them in. So this is not something that's making a developer do anything well and above what they're already doing. But what I'm asking is to increase the size of that tree. Because if you buy a new house, it's going to take you about three or four years for that tree to actually really mature to where it is. So what I'm proposing, and I'm saying basically there are no current provisions. The proposed language would be that residential development 
would be put into the current section where currently the landscaping requirements only speak to multifam mixed use development and commercial. So I'm adding a residential section, but it would read for any proposed subdivision for the creation of more than 10 lots, one tree per lot shall be required at a 3.5 inch caliper in size or 10 feet in height at the time of planting. I got that ideology from the section of landscaping where it ties to vegetative buffers. If you have a residential property beside a commercial property, you're required to put in either a privacy fence or you can do a vegetative buffer. But because we want that vegetative buffer to grow pretty fast, you are required to put that in at three feet in height at the time you plant it. So it's with that same ideology that I want the trees to be 10 feet in height when they actually um, put them in. But if you're wondering where this 10 lot threshold came from, the definition of the subdivision is basically the creation of one lot. So if you were to take one lot and cut it in half, but you have tried to apply all of this to it, it's a little bit heavy handed. So I talked to the county. We felt that maybe a 10 lot threshold would be a 10 lot subdivision would be big enough that these uh, provisions will be applicable. But anything below that, I do think that's a little bit heavy handed. So that's why I put that threshold in there. Are we going to look at possibility of recommending trees that are appropriate for our area and that trees like right now you're looking at trees who who their root structures tearing up sidewalks tearing up pavement yes. just because that's the way they grow and then the other thing is some type of uniformity um, and this will speak to mill villages used to there was always when you put up a mill house you, you put up two oak trees yeah. There was one. There was one on either side of the front yard, and that's why some places around you see these huge, tremendous trees because they've been there a hundred years or more. But the idea is that it was uniform. So yes. that's the other thing is I've seen like I know that s some have used the the red maples. They've used Bradford pears. Uh, some have used. Um, that, that's a really good point. Not to cut myrtles, you off. But if you don't put something that can live here very well, an ornamental tree could be. You know, I might pick something because I like the way it looked, yes. but it might not be appropriate. That's what um, I know our public works department's working on what to put down at the lake. Something we we actually water, but not mess things up. It's, it, it'll it surprise you how often this conversation is held. And the missing thing we don't have is we don't have a plant list. That's what you're basically talking about. So mm -hmm. sometimes it works itself out where. Um, we, you guys approved the development. Biscuitville is a perfect example. The trees specified on the landscape plan sounded great when they submitted to the county. When the contract is out there building them, they specified one, an oak tree under a, a um, power line. So they work, we have to work some things out. Mm -hmm. But we routinely are asked, what's the plant list? Now, the plant list I'm talking about, we can cater it to what we want. I think what City of Fever does is they pretty much reference the North Carolina uh, there's a state um, plant list that's native to North Carolina mm -hmm. so I think one we can reference that to cover this state but I do think we have the authority if you wanted to kind of trim that down a little bit to things that we're they're very specific to what we want to see here we can do that as well um, personally I was getting ready to add the street trees and all that kind of stuff like that I, I didn't know if you know, that's that one area where you're requiring trees to line the entire street, which I think is beautiful. Mm -hmm. You may get pushed back with the developer. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to at least start the conversation with the size of a tree. I do think it's well within our rights, and I think we do we should do that by developing a plant list. But I'm saying it's not like we have to create something out of a vacuum. It's some, there's language there that we can reference. We just have to put that language in, in the ordinance. Madam Mayor, ma'am. Yes, sir. Uh, Cantor, you mentioned um, uh, 10 lots or less wouldn't be required to plant the shrubbery you're talking about or trees. Yes. Don't you think people are going to come in with a nine lot division and then add nine to it and nine to it? While that is possibly uh, uh, something that could happen, if you're looking at your typical size of subdivision we're annexing in 170 lots 50 lots 80 lots 
I don't see a developer going through that tedious space just to stop putting in trees. Um, like I said, we're not asking them to do anything they aren't already doing. We're just telling them to put in a bigger one. They are already putting in trees, one tree per lot, without there being a requirement. So that's why I said I thought this through. I didn't think that tweaking the size of the tree would be that big of a deal but in my conversations with the county city of Fairview, and other places they do caution just putting general language because the definition of the subdivision is when you create one lot in the two that's considered a subdivision so if we went into some of these heavy handed uh items and you're trying to apply it to a three lot subdivision that may be a little bit uh to, to where it's not practical if you guys wanted to tweak that threshold um, beyond 10 or smaller than that, I'm perfectly fine. The main gist is just to understand that there's a threshold that needs to be in place where if you go and try to apply this to three lots, it may not be applicable. Well, maybe we could eliminate the whole thing just by making it a requirement, not 10 lots or less or 10 lots or more, but that had to be a, a requirement for a certain kind of tree, certain size tree. I, I will say that with respect to trees being planted, the issue of it being um, detrimental for a two lot subdivision isn't as bad is another idea I really wanted to float, um, but I, I, I kind of need to take it to legal. Um, I had explored the option of um, right now in our park, um, this section of our ordinance, it allows people to pay into a parks and rec fee if they don't want to do open space. I don't like that. I think you should be required to put a park in a subdivision. If you have 170 lots, our open space is the pond. And then they pay their fee, and we don't get a park. So a pond is not a park. I agree with but that. from what my research has concluded, I think that is a general statute in terms of payment in lieu of the parks and rec. So I think it may be a little bit more tricky to deal with that which is why i didn't make it a part of this um but that's my mentality in it i don't i think it's great it, it's funding that goes into the um, parks and recs um department but what you're basically dealing with is a developer who's just going to pay the fee put the ponds in the wetland area and you have an entire uh set 170 lot subdivision without any open space but if it's um for instance if it was income-based housing like what is behind millstone one of the requirement for the developer to get the money is it has to have play space and so i'm thinking that that if you you look at the size developments we have and their distance from where we are and we know that we want to have more parks i don't see why we couldn't in, encourage the develop instead of taking money in lieu of because i can tell you as long as i've been mayor and before then when i was a commissioner I can't tell you where the money goes other than goes into the that, big that's pot. That's why I don't, I don't, so you're not, how, yeah. So how yeah. does, say, steeplechase, how does steeplechase benefit directly other than just having our parks and rec department? But if they had a, a playground within, then you can, you know, they can, the only thing I think might be a, a problem would be then does it become the property of the town to maintain? And that might have been a, a sidebar that wasn't. Yeah. You know, I don't know, but I do believe as we grow and as distance from here, children are so, there's so many children in these housing developments, and there's really, they're in the street. What I think, that's... what I think played into why that was dealt with at the state level um, is taught to distance. There is basically a situation where if you have an established parks plan in a municipality and you have subdivisions in close proximity to that park, they're really in the need for the park in the subdivision but like you said most of our annexations are far out um so it's not that i don't want to do it i think i need to talk to dan to explore how to do it because i don't think we have the authority to just change it in the ordinance but that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it what i would love to see is the elimination of the payment in lieu or that's really where that threshold came in because if i'm making someone put in a park it makes sense on 150 lots it doesn't on two. Mm -hmm. If a lot is considered a subdivision for one lot being created in the two, <clears> and we start making them put in parks, that that's not applicable. But I do wholeheartedly believe, because I live in a neighborhood without a clubhouse or a park of any kind, 
and and that's something that I take personally. So I do think with the number of subdivisions we're pumping through this town, um, I do think um, there needs to be thresholds that require a park that eliminate the ability of just paying money and putting the ponds in uh, the wetland area. So that's something. And I do think based on my understanding I, I i think we probably need to do a couple of these work sessions so stuff like this in the green growth toolkit you'll see when i get to that in a minute those are things we need to work um but for right now i really wanted to use what i have today to establish some conversations to give you guys a starting point on giving me some changes madam mayor yes sir. chancellor what was yeah. your threshold number 10. no for the uh, park well, basically, when I talked to the county about thresholds in general, mm -hmm. we, we basically said we know we didn't want it to have just the generic language. Right. So we just came up with a 10 lot threshold, but um, we can tweak that. Um, so if, especially when we're talking about parks, I think you should at least have something a little bit higher than that. But, um, the, the idea is to establish a threshold where some of these things wouldn't be applicable because you're not going to put a park on a three lot subdivision. Right. Um, but if you guys wanted to tweak that number in terms of with that threshold up a little bit, I think that's more than, um. Fifty units and up. Now, one thing where the number thirty is very interesting number. That's also the threshold that the fire code established for the secondary street that you have to sprinkle if you don't have it. So that may be a good number to to, to set this at. Thirty um, fifty. Yeah, thirty or fifty. But something more. If you guys want to tweak the, the the number of the the lots, that's perfectly fine. The main point is to establish the threshold where some of these wouldn't be applicable madam mayor mm -hmm. I, I have a question i don't know if this would be too complicated but is it not a pro is it appropriate to get the appearance committee involved with or giving us some suggestions about the appropriateness of the I, I think any suggestion i'm wide open any suggestion that we get um i just basically find a way to create legislation out of it that mm -hmm. It is 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 uh, amenable to the board, but um, I, I I'm actually asking for as much feedback as I can um, from the parents committee, citizens, um, developers, um, property owners. Yeah, this would be a, I think a good a good task for uh, the parents committee because um, they talk of uniformity and they talk of things that they could what could they do. Well, this would give them some input or so especially they, you're talking about plant lists. Yeah, yeah. So you might could that might be something to let this let this part run through the committee yeah. and just get some ideas from it. Yeah, we can do that. That might that might might be a good way of getting some ideas for us. Madam Mayor Mayor? Yes, sir. Um <clears throat> a lot of the existing subdivisions that we have in the town now don't think ahead for stuff like this for the future. Uh Mr. Bellflower subdivision in Kingston, they got a beautiful place right up front at the entrance. Mm -hmm. that they could put a park in there if they wanted to yeah or they could put something else in there but it's nice that they thought ahead enough mm -hmm. to leave that land open you know you, you have some developers that actually uh perfectly willing to do this stuff um but it's the ones that uh don't that i feel like if there's a requirement we wouldn't have to worry about asking about it um but like i said my main goal here is to find that delicate balance on what can we do through the subdivision or to beautify and make our neighborhood stronger but not so heavy-handed where you're discouraging development where is that middle ground now a lot of times you hear the sky is falling um from developers sometimes but i get it that that's their bottom dollar and things of that nature so i'm cognizant of, of that as well but it's that middle ground that we're trying to find you see there's a lot of people think that like in my neighborhood in timberlake uh see what call your school is there they have a park but i don't think that park was intended for the subdivision use, I think it was intended for the residents of the, of the, the pupils at the school. Same thing at, at Rockfish, anything they have over there, I don't believe was intended for the weekend use of the kids from yeah. Gulf Acres. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe it was. But uh, I think, and I've always believed that, that every subdivision 
should have a land set aside for a park in it. Not money in lieu of, you know. Well, one thing I'm doing with the, um, I'm studying this uh, green growth toolkit. Um, it has sections that talks about incentives. You have to be very careful with that uh, with respect to subdivisions. But I have found um, in my experience in, in zoning that if you can find something that would be attractive to the developer to do in lieu of something else we're needing, if we can find that where we're not compromising anything we're trying to do, usually uh, the most attractive incentive is a density bump. Um, but I really shy away from that um, um, a lot, but um, the Green Growth Toolkit has incentives, but it's based on wildlife preservation, not necessarily the beautification of subdivisions, but they give you examples of some things that you might be able to entice a developer to do if he were to do X, Y, and Z. So I'm exploring some things like that as well, um, but the density bump is the one that comes out the most that a lot of people aren't that comfortable with. Um, and lastly, with cross references, what I put this in here Just for. Second, oh, go ahead. Oh, yeah. oh no, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Here I am, Chancellor. Um, my daughter, she moved into a subdivision, and the developers did put in a park and all, but the um, H HOA, um, they were in charge of it, and the money that each one of the yeah. residents paid took care of the park mm -hmm. so it's, it's your homeowner's hoa fees it was um, up the town or anything it was up the subdivision and what i think in my situation i'll just get personal for a second i pay hoa fees mm -hmm. i do too. for I do cutting too. the transformer that's how we make i don't have a park i don't have a clubhouse I don't pay, <laughs> but i pay my fees every month so that's what happens when you because you're required to have a hoa when you do a subdivision so all these subdivisions were pumping in with no parks like you said, if I move into Preserve Lake Air Church, I don't see the fee that went to the parks and yeah. department. Mm -hmm. Where's my park? I'm paying HOA fees. So in my neighborhood, my fees pay for the, the maintenance of the storm pond and cutting trees and uh, cutting grass in the common areas. Mm -hmm. And that's about it. I would love to be able to walk my daughter. I got sidewalks on one side of the street, not on my side. So I would love to walk my daughter down a sidewalk to a park in my neighborhood, in every neighborhood. Mm -hmm. That's my vision. And I think it's doable. Um, you can't tell me you got 80, 80 acres and you can't give me a one acre park. Like, you know, so. And, and I don't see any reason why in some cases, if there's a neighborhood school, that the developer can't partner with the neighborhood school. Because you think how much they could enhance. The, the park's already there. But think about what they could add to that park. And we could have a partnership with the school. Because just like C. Wayne Collier, well, you've got Rockfish across the street. You've got Baldwin. Those could be, if we had a good partnership with the school systems, those could be. And it, you could have it so it's a neighborhood park so you wouldn't be bringing people in. But I can tell you, most of these elementary schools, people drive over there so their kids can play on the playground mm -hmm. equipment. So if you if we got the developer to partner with the adjacent school now there's no school I know that we went to one that we visited that they actually had within the um, the neighborhood walking trails so oh, you didn't wow. necessarily have a park but you had designated something that recreation trails. Do, yeah. so that what you could do is you know, like we've got a, a mile out here mile point six where they had it marked off so you had something within there for outlets for the adults and maybe for something for the children but we haven't really I think that's what's good about this is looking at the possibility. The options are wide open. Yeah. Um, one thing that is so powerful about what you just said, and I went through this, the number one driver of the purchase of a home is the school district. Mm -hmm. Especially when you're dealing with middle-aged parents with kids. Area might be beautiful. I'm looking at the school district. Mm -hmm. And if you're talking about us, creating a new way of thinking where you facilitate connection between developers and schools for parks and connectors and trails and things of that nature that's what we're talking when i say quality of life that's what i'm talking about i'd be more than happy to move into a neighborhood that i could walk to my school 
it's a park in my neighborhood. It's walking trails in my backyard. We got street trees aligned. That's what I'm going towards. The question is, how do we achieve that by keeping the developments? Because it's one thing, if I can get a developer to realize if you do these things, your neighborhood is enhanced. Mm -hmm. It's a selling point for your neighborhood now that you have a park, mm -hmm. now that you have sidewalks on both sides of the street, street trees and things of that nature, larger trees. Now, if you see the tree in my front yard, it looks beautiful, but I've been... Uh, nailing landscape spikes in the last five years <laughs> but when I moved there it was about this tall and it didn't have a leaf on it um, why can't we just simply say give me a more mature tree in this area I think that's something we can do now what we're talking about here in the last slide with existing ordinance references <clears throat> what we deal with a lot is there are times where I'm applying our ordinance, but it's really in reference to another section from another department. If we're talking about the secondary interests with, with uh, subdivisions, that's a fire code reference. Mm -hmm. If we're talking about uh, streets and being up DOT standards, that's a standards and specs reference. But we don't have these ordinances referenced in our codes. So while we point developers to those ordinances, it would be great if at the street section of the subdivision ordinance, I could just reference compliance with the standards and specs. If we're talking about subdivision and we're talking about secondary interests that require sprinklers, I can reference the fire code, not the entire code, just reference compliance with it and cross reference it. Because what you see here is most of the stuff I just went through is in the zoning ordinance, but you don't have a landscaping section in our subdivision ordinance so there are opportunities where we're combing through and we've been talking about this a while um i think don and i have been talking about tweaking sections that we could reference in the standards and specs from the day that he adopted it but this is an opportunity just to basically strengthen the enforceability of our ordinances it's not creating a new section it's just hammering home the different sections and how they relate to each other the three the four three of the main areas are the standards and specs our stormwater ordinance and our fire code appendices now the green growth toolbox that's something that we probably need to have a complete work session that dedicated to that but what i'd like to do is bring in our stormwater um director and um nc wildlife um and she came here and presented the three of us could work very well together. That is a very large undertaking. But what we can do in subdivisions is that there are sections where you can actually entice and incentivize a developer not to put a storm pond. And he creates a system of swells throughout the neighborhood that are planted with this vegetation that does two things. It cleans the water and it treats the capacity. So it is a stormwater system, but it looks like landscaping. Um, that's something that if we're going to explore that in the subdivision on this, I would definitely need our stormwater director um, to be a part of that as well. So that's not a reference, but that's something that I would like at least our next uh, work session or at least one work session to be completely dedicated to the green growth toolkit. Um, it's talking about clustering developments and things of that nature. Um, but it's something a little bit too large to put in with everything else. But um, I think that that's something that we could benefit from. Anyway, but that said, um, I'm open to any other sections that you guys um, want us to explore or any other um, issues that you see in, in the town that you think we need to address that we can address through the subdivision ordinance. Remember, I do have another question. Okay. <clears throat> you spoke a while ago about putting taller trees on a buffer line, you mm -hmm. know, like side of a store or something. Do we still suggest red tips for that? Or do we want a tree? Well, when you're talking about buffering, um, we don't specify trees, you specify shrubs. Um, you have two options to uh, treat a buffer. You can treat it with a privacy fence to I think um, six, foot. six foot height, or if you don't want to put a privacy fence, um, the Alco gas station uh, right down the street is a perfect example. If you look at that side of it on the left, 
um, this adjacent to residential um, houses, um, those plants had to be three feet in height at the time they put them in. Otherwise, you can put them in as ground covers. But that's where I got the, the ideology about increasing the height. Most of the trees they plant on individual lots are about six feet. I'm only uh, telling them to increase it to about eight or ten. Um, so it's not like it, they're going to go out and have to put in a 20-foot oak tree, but I need something a little bit bigger than the one that they're putting out there now. Okay. Anyone else have a comment or question or somewhere else you yeah. want to look at? And like Even if it's, it's any section of the Southern Division ones, if it's a concern you have or something you want us to look at. i got some comments, Madam, um, Madam Mayor. Let me yes, look sir. At, yeah. Chancellor, I like this slide. In fact, this slide goes to the heart of the revision. It truly does. Mm -hmm. Because the majority of my notes, I should show them to you, all center around the documents that you have on this slide, the ordinances and the codes. And, and for example, for the fire code about sprinkler systems, I had to go to a whole different... Yeah, that's, that's my point. I, that's exactly I had to go point. find yeah. this thing. Now, we Myself. have it captured at plan review because all of us are there. Well, but when yeah, I'm talking yeah. to an individual developer about the subdivision ordinance, mm -hmm. I got to send them um, to the fire department. I wish I could just reference that section of the code I know. and then tell them who to contact. So that's what I'm talking about. It, 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 it's a, it'll surprise you how often these different codes apply to the same project. Streets are always going to be a part of a subdivision. Um, but the enforcement of it comes from public works so but see, that leads me to the other section yeah. too is that i know we have a lot of standards but it seems like that we have or at least it appears that we have an enforcement issue i wouldn't say an enforcement issue with subdivisions um because the code is the code um yeah. um when when we say code enforcement we're talking about like junk cars and things of that nature but it's very rare a situation where um, we meet with a developer and we just tell him what the code says. He doesn't like it. Okay. There's a variance for setbacks. Okay. It's a variance from the standards and specs. So at the end of the day, we're here to explain what the ordinance is. And I wouldn't say it's a code enforcement office uh, issue because you're not going to get a permit. <laughs> so okay. if you don't meet the standards and specs, yeah. you just don't, won't get a permit. Enforcement comes in if there is some scenario where we approve something and like for instance and there are checks and balance all around I, i'll give you a perfect example with respect, respect to standards and specs let's say that we have a subdivision that is like georgetown estates they're gearing up to go to another phase and put in new streets but they have not come to the board to get acceptance of the streets in the previous section and they won't answer don's phone call i have a section in this ordinance called the 75 percent rule mm -hmm. if a previous section gets up to 75 percent completion i can haul all for further construction if they haven't had those streets um accepted by the town so there are some checks and balances where i wouldn't say it's a enforcement issue it's just more of us just letting the developer know okay i have five residential permits they're not moving until i get a red uh, ordinance from the public works department so there are systems okay. in place now in the event that you find an area where it doesn't have that check and balance that's what i'm looking for something that appears to be something that is a crack someone can slip through because we don't have a 75 percent rule on certain areas so that's what i'm really looking for tell me what it, there is an issue that you see and give me the ability to find language to address it um and like i said with these ordinances these aren't ordinances in the zoning ordinance at all but they apply to the projects that are approved through the zoning ordinance so i feel like it's it's a really good practice to um reference them in in the regulations. one more mayor and okay not quite sure. and i and i tell you chance that's why i said this goes to the heart it, it truly does um and when i started putting my notes together and i was looking through the different sections of the subdivision ordinance and of course it you know hasn't been updated since 09 you know and then i started to look at all of the other manuals and, and i'm going to tell you you know there's one thing that came out to me and i'm just going to ask you yeah sure. you don't know should we should we consider drafting a hope mills udo 
Ooh. Huh? You want to get this bold? This the part that I duck. Uh, huh? <laughs> um, I'll tell you this. Um, what are your thoughts about that? I've participated in the development um, of a UDO mm-hmm. uh, in several municipalities. Um, the word that I used earlier is incentives. And not to, to speak on uh, other municipalities, but usually the UDO ordinances that you see developers really having issues with are not all the ones that don't have incentives. I'll give you a prime example of what they did in Atlanta. You don't have big pockets of vacant land downtown Atlanta. You have a half acre site you're trying to build a 30 story skyscraper on. Uh But you have a usable, and see, they have differences between open space and usable open space. Open space is your pond. Usable open space requirement is a park. You're required to do that. How you do a park on a half acre lot that's 30 stories? You can provide usable open space at balconies, uh, tiered trees at the second, third, fourth level, uh, rooftop gardens, things of that nature, and that's where the density boom comes in. So that's what you're getting at where if you do a UDO that requires all these things, but you're not actually providing an incentive, it's just a a, 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 a cost issue for the developer. Um, and it's very real. In the subdivision I live in right now, um, my wife was upset that the second phase of houses came in at about $80,000 below the cost of our house. Mm. I contacted the developer and he used those three letters. You did. Because of the way it's enforced, it affected their bottom dollar. Mm. My suggestion would be if you were going to go in the form of some kind of unified development ordinance, we find ways to get what we want out the ordinance. Right, right. In a way that at least provides some type of incentive for a developer. Most developers will tell you, I'm here to make money. I'm not here to destroy the town. Give me something I can latch on to and we can talk. What are those incentives that we're talking about? Um, But um, UDOs, overlay districts, I'm a planner. I love them. But you have to find a way to do them. Where you're not killing the ability of the developer to make a, you, a dollar. Can't you do the same thing within the ordinances we currently have? In other words, if you if that's you, the other way. If you do yeah. it that way, then what you've done is you haven't tagged it so it looks like it's a burden, and you also have it so that you've got it so that you know, like I, I'm looking right now at the which I was going to bring up next, and I'll just is our section in our subdivision on parks, recreation, and open space. If you read through this, you're going to find there's so many spots here that it's left up to somebody to determine the cost of and how much the land is worth. Well, if you, I think this will be an area, my suggestion would be to let Lamarco, um, yeah. our Parks and Rec Director, take a look at it. Let Parks and Rec Committee take a look at it. What would we want it to look like if we did have a park that we let the HOA take care of yeah. in a neighborhood? Because what we have here is an open-ended thing where it looks like if I were a developer, what I would do is I'd say, all right, you figure out how much this much of land would cost, and it's, at the, you know. And it, just pay the fee. That's what I'm saying. And the fees, the fees in, I think that fee is, can be determined about what the worth of the land is. And that's where I think this, if you did say you're going to designate, and they, they haven't really defin, a d- good definition about, Yes, it, it will tell you a max of one half the required recreation area, maybe water, the shape, and it tell I mean it gives you depth, but I think if we had somebody take a closer look at this that has the ability to understand how to build a park and landscaping stuff, because this isn't our expertise. But if somebody can make a good recommendation then we might make this part of our development ordinance look better that's what i think is so unique about this because it's just like me bringing in beth with the green growth tool Mm -hmm. there are sections that require my engagement with another department i'm one of the only departments that i'm pretty much married to inspections everything i do i talk directly to inspections or don in public works or so and that's unique that there's one department that has different 
connections. I'd like to at least enhance people's understanding of how those connections um, fit and the referencing. But you're right. If we're talking about tweaking the parks and recreation open space, why not bring in the parks and rec director? If we're talking about two kits and uh, swells and treating stormwater, why not bring in the stormwater director? Because that's their level of expertise and, and they can how, tell us how, how we can put it. familiar is, Lamar, is, is Mr. Morrison with this section? He's very familiar with park uh, design and stuff like that. That's but what I, I mean, rec. But what I'm saying with this particular ordinance, because when a developer comes in, is, is, he, is he on task with with the different parts of this yeah. part of our ordinance, because that's what I'm thinking is it's it's long, it's got a lot of information, but um, you know it says it even says a payment in lieu of dedication shall be paid at the same time as or prior to submission, and it also says it's, it can be prorated if you're doing it in mm -hmm. sections. Mm -hmm. Who follows up on all that? That's what I'm. That's where I'm going at. Is I think that's how you make it um, like a UDO. But it's not. You, you just now, hit the nail on yeah, the head. You, you the minute that. I walk in and say to you, I'm dead on arrival. Yeah, right. well, How do you create yeah. the language that gets us? Because the key the same, is getting what we want to achieve. That's where I'm going. That's where I'm going. Thing, yeah. But you're not sending it out there. Hey, you're going to yeah. do this because this is what we require. But just like there's a lot written in here. And if we, if we put what's in here with um, some better language. Yeah. I think that's what it needs is some better language. Yes, sir. You know, there's a lot of stuff in here that's outdated because it's been 11 years or so since this ordinance was addressed. Well, one thing I like to uh, the one thing I like to point out, yeah. we have had amendments to it. It just hadn't been codified. When we did the sidewalk ordinance, mm -hmm. um, where we require sidewalks on both sides, that's in this section. When we create the threshold that doesn't apply for sidewalks if you're not doing certain level of development, that's in here. We just hadn't codified it. But you are right. 2009 was the last time. Um, which is why I'm glad we're doing this, because after this uh, ordinance, we could possibly go ahead and codify everything. Well, there's a number of text amendments that haven't been codified yeah. into it since that, then. That's exactly my point. And, yeah, and, and, and that's okay, because, you know, I think we're going to capture it. And then the new uh, 160 D goes in effect in January. So Now, I, I would I'll stop him right here, because he just did my... <laughs> There's one thing that got my hair about as gray as I don't know what. There is, just to let you guys know, yeah. it'll probably be in about yeah. another couple months. But uh, the deadline is January. I can't wait to January. I have to bring it to you probably in November. But there's a 160D state-level mandate that Sorry, came yeah. down that yeah. we have to do all these updates of our zoning ordinance. I'm working mm -hmm. with the county right now. I'm just trying to package it up. Yeah. on how and where do I bring it to you but it has to come to you guys first it has to go to the planning board and then it has to come back to us before January of next year um, um, I think the county just did east overs um, I'm trying to work on ours before they get to us so that whenever they get to us I can just kind of hand it off but it's something that I hadn't talked to you guys about but something I'm working on for probably about three months um, it's just basically updating the uh, um, certain general statute sections all it's throughout, thorough. yeah, throughout the entire mm -hmm. ordinance. But um, go ahead. I just had a comment, um, and, and I agree with everything everybody said and talked about. But um, those three little letters they scare me like everybody yeah. else. <laughs> and at the end of the day, this is my thing, and and I understand changes need to be made and language needs to be changed and we need to make things better but also at the end of the day I don't want to scare um, developers off from Hope Mills a developer comes in he'll do whatever you tell him to do he's going to do it because he's going to make the money but he's going to put it on the back of the homeowner yeah. and I don't want to see us get this thing too technical and um, run somebody that may have looked at Hope Mills as making Hope Mills their home but because the developers had to raise the price of the house so much from what we did, they can't afford to come into Hope Mills and they have to move further out. Um, That's and, the balance. And same thing yeah. with businesses too. You know, they'll do whatever you tell you know to come in, but at the end of the day, if they can move just outside the city limits and build cheaper, I mean, it's. 
That that's a very good point. That's I don't the tight run people off. That's the tight rope that we walk with every ordinance change. What can we do to come up language to address the needs we're talking about, but not in a way that deters? Because uh, I'll tell you, they are coming. Uh, the development is coming at a level I haven't seen in a long time. Yeah, just, you know, and but, but my point is, I don't want to do something, and all of a sudden everything stops. Yeah, and I think that's what the word. I think that's what those three letters. Yeah, are. I get it, but yeah, the general I mean, public, we, they hear those we, three letters. We, everybody. We so that it's current. Yeah. But we we don't want to put it so that it sounds like we're trying to. At the end of the day, yeah. At, at the end of the, the day, I don't want to put it progress. on the back of the people, and that's where it's going to go. Yeah. So everything that we're doing with this ordinance is going to be on our back, mm -hmm. or the taxpayers' back when they buy that house. That house payments is going up and up and up. And then you could eventually create a situation you're pricing people out of whole meals. That's um, exactly. Um, That's one thing I'm that, uh, and, and what I like about these subdivisions I see coming in, they're different price points. Um, mm -hmm. While I, I think I like the high quality developments, I don't want to see seven subdivisions at 350 and up. I want some price points that uh, a working class person can afford and if you're starting to do a lot of these things you're right the developers just gonna roll it into the cost of the house you could end up pricing people out of being able to live an affordable uh, live an affordable house um and hope mill so that's technically mm -hmm. we're, we're talking about the threshold we're talking about the landscaping requirements that's in okay. what's in the back of my mind how do we do this but in a way where development is still going to move forward because he's going to do it, but I'm not bankrupting him to be able to do it. That's the key. I, I have one more thing, yeah. too. Um, I know we have MIAs and stuff like that. So if a, a subdivision comes in and in our MIA, they have to build it to our specs. But I know years ago, the town ran into it and probably having to deal with these situations now where developer or whoever would come in and they permit a subdivision under the county which had less stringent um, requirements than we did mm -hmm. but they do all the um, the roads and utility stuff all that and then before they started selling lots they come to the town they want the town to annex it so they could charge more when they sold the lots what, and then we were well what we ran up with was being annexed in the neighborhood that our public works department didn't didn't inspect the streets they weren't to our standards but we're stuck with them so how do we how do we keep something from like that happening I know you had the MIAs and stuff yeah. like that but how do we address something like that to where developers don't do that I'll tell you we actually are already doing that um, when you do an annexation if you've noticed at that last hearing where you officially adopt the annexation it comes with a memo of conditions yeah. so what happens is and it's a delicate balance we bring these developers in so well in advance on the front end with these sketch plans i'm i've finally gotten to a point where we're getting annexation petitions before the start of any construction um and what happens is the pwc agreement um is triggered um, we really started enforcing it. It's been uh, in existence since the 70s, but it really says when you apply for water and sewer, no permits can be issued until you get your PWC um, permit. So even if they um, get the subdivision approved in the county, they can't get their permits to start anything until they go to PWC. The PWC permit triggers annexations to us. So we're getting it well in advance. Now, the only regulation in the county that's not consistent with ours is the sidewalks on both sides. And I'm working with the county on that, but one of the reasons why that's a little bit tricky is because that's us asking the county commissioners to approve that in the county. And there's some reluctance because if there's an area so far out in our MIA that we don't want to service it and we say no, they have a requirement of sidewalks on both sides in an area they aren't maintaining. So, but other than that, every other regulation is exactly the same from the town and the county. But what we started getting very aggressive on is bringing the developers in early on sketch plan. And so we are negotiating them submitting these annexations so that from the very beginning of turning dirt, 
you're dealing with Beth, you're dealing with Don, you're dealing with me. Um, now, there are some divisions that you're seeing under construction now that were just approved 10 years ago, and you're just seeing them start construction. But if you're looking at Sweetwater, that came to us first. Mm -hmm. Preserver Lake Up Church, they cleared the lots. They hadn't touched them until annexation. So the last couple of annexations you're, you're getting, that's coming because by the time it comes in here, we're talking to these guys well in advance going to great lengths to explain these regulations a lot of people don't realize the standards and specs is just mirroring the dot code it's not anything new but we used to hear y'all stuff is much stronger it's exactly the same you just didn't have a group of people it making is. you do it i learned it too it's exactly the same <laughs> they're just so used to not having yeah. to do it so but we have that was a very big concern because if we didn't address that we're basically asking you guys to to, uh, to annex in a substandard development. Mm -hmm. Now, when you're getting an annexation, you have a memo that has a recommendation from my department, a recommendation from fire, a recommendation of from public works, stormwater. If you listen, if you think about the Sweetwater subdivision, not only did our previous fire marshal, Mr. Ham, um, make them comply, he made them sign an agreement that they were not going to start their 31st house until they put in the infrastructure for the secondary. They did that um, for Sweetwater. Yeah, so my point of it is that happened well in advance of it coming to you guys because the agreement was in the annexation packet. So now we can't make anybody, but it's a negotiation. That actually was a very, very uh, big concern. But I do feel like we haven't officially solved it yet. But we're well in advance of addressing that issue. Madam Mayor. Yes, sir. Other than you requesting that the trees be taller, uh, what other things are you requesting the number of trees to be uh, enlarged as well? And you know, still having two. Have four or something? Well, what what you're doing on the residential subdivision, they are already already doing just one tree per lot. I don't want to increase it beyond that. I just want to make it bigger. Where you have an increase in the volume of landscaping is on your non-residential, which is your commercial developments. Where right now he may only have to put in four trees. Now he'd have to put in eight. Um, now he, he may uh, after the change. So if he's required to put in 20 shrubs now, now he'd have to put in 40. Um, it really that's why I want you guys to go to those two locations it is visible like I can look at the landscape plan and tell you the counts but you can drive by it and you can visibly see that that circle K has almost twice as many shrubs and trees at a higher height than what we have here and so um, I know it's doable because those developments are still pumping through city of Fairville at those increased requirements now just in full disclosure in Cumberland County Hope Mills has the second most stringent landscaping requirements before the change the most stringent is city of Fairville but if you go to these other towns the drop-off is tremendous so I don't personally, as a landscape architect, what I don't like is you have this great looking development and it's like two trees out front and it doesn't look good. So I think if that threshold or, or that amount of increase I'm asking for isn't so bad to where it's going to bankrupt the development, but I think the value you get on how much better it's going to look is what I'm, I'm getting at. Madam Mayor, um, I know things aren't like they used to be <clears throat> um, used to be when we'd build a house all we had to do was clear a lot for the house to set on we didn't touch any of the other trees now they strip the land and go back and have to replant the oak trees in my front yard were that big around when I bought my house in 84 now they're like this so if they're not smothered out they grow faster. And so if you put them too close, they don't breathe well, as the yeah. old saying goes. Uh, I think we should have better landscaping, a little more, let's call it 
mature trees, but you know they can get mature trees that are dwarfs and come up with the same thing. They they won't be up in the power lines, or of course we don't have many power lines at Hope Mills, but thank God. Most of the uh, the trees you're gonna see in the front yard of subdivision, um, they aren't planting these humongous trees. It's just. Um, we can definitely do the plant list, um, but my main goal is just having something a little bit more mature at the time it's in. Um, and that just means that two years later, you have a much stronger um, set of trees on, on these residential lots than it taking three or four years to get. And most of the times, like I said, um, the tree in my front yard is uh, enhanced a great deal, but that's me doing a lot of stuff most homeowners they're not looking at them at all mm -hmm. and so if we can get a bigger one on the the front end but not so much to where i'm not asking someone to plant a 15 foot tall tree um but i do think uh the type of the height they're coming in now at about seven to eight feet going up a little mm -hmm. higher than that i don't think that's um, that much of a bot uh, of an increase in their finance and where it'll have a negative effect like what mr uh, marley was saying in terms of them not moving forward with the subdivision if we get a little bit more than that maybe but i think where we're and and, and i'll i'll test this out too if i st start floating some of these uh thresholds and some of these uh, regulations and i start getting some negative feedback maybe we tweak it um but if i hadn't heard anything um in terms of a major pushback, I think we move forward. Madam Mayor, I have a follow yes, up sir? regarding your parks and record uh, comments earlier. Mm -hmm. Is um, is Lamarco invited to sit on your planning board meetings? <laughs> planning board or yeah. plan review? Plan review, sorry. Plan review, plan we've review. actually had conversations with, because some of these developments, um, we've talked to him about becoming uh, one of the uh, uh, members and he is an open uh, okay. invitation. So I don't see there be anything wrong with it. I think the more people we have, cause oh, yeah. uh, PWC is a permanent member. Right. Um, um, police is more of, um, we just let them know about the annexation and stuff like that, but fire is as well. But I do think um, parks and rec would be, perfect I, I think basically if we have a project that we know hits that certain area we do an open invitation but i'll open it up to for him to, uh, to become a member in general especially if we're working through this kind of stuff well yeah and that's why i brought that up yeah. because i mean the feedback from the review like you said it's all going it's all going to be captured on the condition sheet yeah see and that's what the strength is i mean yeah. if we're going to if we're going to use this slide which i applaud you for doing you know, this is the standard slide. If we go through this and we revise and we modify it the right way, and then that gives your review team. That's exactly where I'm going with exactly it. Exactly. Because what, what this generates do. is a stronger condition sheet on yes. the back end. Yes. So what we do is. It goes to the county. The condition sheet is attached to my zoning approval mm -hmm. when they're going to permitting. Um, we have a new, I don't know if you guys knew this, but we have a whole new routing system that we um, established where um, no permit is issued from inspections until it has all the signatures of all the departments. But it starts with my department. Mm -hmm. So when I get a permit of any kind, storage shed to uh, Lowe's, it comes to me first. I develop the routing sheet. I sign it. I route it. Um, but that's where you get in these cross references. But the condition sheet is a collection of all of our ordinances that are pertinent to the project. So we make sure that that developer, because everybody swear, I didn't know I needed to put in sidewalks. I didn't know I needed to. No, it's highlighted. Um, if you remember with Serge, they told us they didn't know. And I put out a document that he signed. Yeah. <laughs> so there are things we do that, like I said, there are systems of checks and balances that we have in place. But this puts it in the code. Yes. So it yes. really is increasing the enforceability of it. We're not creating new language. We're just creating more instances for you to understand that these are actually requirements um, as well. Madam Mayor, uh -huh. I have two follow-up questions. One of those questions is, are we, can I attend a plan review meeting if I'm able to attend? Because I've spoken with you about this before. Um, I actually want to see the process. I heard it's very thorough. And two, if we go through all of this, when there's like a subdivision, certain things can be put on the consent agenda. So if you go through all of these recommendations, because by the time you come to us, they already know they got to have sidewalks. They already know they have to have all this stuff. We just sitting up here going through the motions. Can some of this stuff get put on the consent agenda and then we pull it 
if we actually have a question about it because from what I hear, because when I first got elected, I would call you yeah. and ask you all these questions. And it, this stuff has been through like a thorough process yes. before it gets to us. So I, we're, I was, we're questioning if we, we can pull it, if we got a question about it. But if this went through all of this. Planning board is a great example. If you go to planning board, that means start at 630. If you're not there by 645, it's over. And they're talk, they're doing forty cases. The entire agenda is consent. Yeah. And I say that because yeah. by the time it goes on the planning board agenda, you guys have approved it to go to the county. I vetted it with the county forty times. Planning staff gives a recommendation. Planning board hears it. By the time it comes back to you guys, it's really up to you. I don't ever want to say it shouldn't be because I don't want the board to think I'm taking something out of your hands. But by the time something gets here, if it's a site plan approval or something like that, or if it's no, not an no. ordinance change, I want y'all to go through that as meticulous as possible. But if there are certain projects, but by the time it get to you, it has a staff recommendation from me, has a planning board recommendation, has the planning staff recommendation. But at planning board, if someone signed up in opposition, it's pulled for discussion. Mm -hmm. If you guys wanted to take that approach, that's well within your rights. What I would do if we are moving to put things on consent, I could roll some of the more detailed information into a manager's report or something of that nature. But it's really up to you guys. I will say some of these projects are courtesies because... You may not remember, you may remember this, site plan approvals were not typically on the agenda. And when our previous time manager was here, what would happen is I'm signing off on something with the county and you're driving down the street, you see a development. It's like, wait a minute, what's going on? So we put them on the agenda almost as a notice because we wanted you guys to be aware of what's going on. If you guys wanted to move in some of those directions, that's perfectly fine with me. Uh, as it relates to your other question, I actually would love it if we set up a system where every so often one of you guys rotated out attending a plan review. Oh, I'd like that. It is yeah. very like that. thorough with the conversations that we're having. It allows you guys to see just how in depth these conversations are from every department because it's almost like a round robin. Mm -hmm. Regardless of what that uh, project is, that developer, and they respect it. Because what we're giving them well in advance of even acquiring property, we're telling them not just the process. We're telling them every single regulation from an ordinance standpoint, from a state regulation, from Army Corps. We're going through every aspect of that project from fire, zoning, public works, um, inspections. We're going through every section of it. And... Typically, I would say not just attend every plan review, but if it's a sketch plan, that's a project that is so big that their whole team is coming to meet with us. That would be the one that would be most beneficial for you guys to see just how early on we are having very, very detailed, in-depth conversations about this. And that's how we're able to get this developer to voluntarily annex before even applying for a permit with PWC. I've had annexations where it's triggered because of our sketch plan, not because of a permit they're getting with PWC. They just want their project. But what we want is the authority to control the project on our jurisdiction, and that's what we get with the annexation. So I, I'd open up to anybody that wanted to come. I can send um, – um, town manager Adams, an update if we have another project that's of that magnitude, and um, I, I think it'd be great for you guys to see. Yes. Oh yeah. 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 No, that's I, what I mean. Rotate oh, them out. Yeah. yeah. yeah you know. Yeah. So, yeah. but we let I send it to her, and then I guess she let you guys know what, yeah. um, whichever one would like to come. But I think. It's not City Academy, but it really gives you guys an insight on how detailed these conversations are that we are having. Because if I'm up here presenting the project, you may 
be looking at it from the approval of a zoning, you not you may not know the extensive conversations Don had about the standards and specs or um, Beth calling the state and dealing with them on certain aspects of it. You just know what's before you when I'm presenting the project. You don't know the extensive conversations that fire, public works inspections, and stormwater may have actually had on the development of the project from their standpoint. Yes, sir. Exactly how is uh, the fire code going to affect uh, this possible ordinance change? Um, I wouldn't say the fire code would affect the change. I just think we need to reference in there there are appendices that you have to adhere to. And the one thing that is directly related to subdivisions is the, the secondary entrance. Uh, you tell a developer that's doing 150 lots who does not have the ability to do a secondary entrance, that he's gonna have to sprinkle those buildings. They're gonna roll it into the cost of the house. Um, but that's a statute. So you can't vary the fire code. You can't vary the building code. So there is no enforcement. You either do it or you're yeah. not getting the permit. Non negotiable. Um, but that's something that bleeds into my approval of a subdivision that could affect a developer deciding he don't wanna do it. Um, but there is no option. If you're doing that subdivision and you have more than 30 lots and you do not have a secondary entrance, you're going to have to sprinkle all those buildings or you're not going to get a sign off from fire. Um, and that's in the um, fire code. So I'm not talking about mentioning that in our in our ordinance, mm -hmm. just cross referencing it so that when we're talking about the subdivision of land, they are aware. Now, we're going to make them aware of the plan review as well, but just to the general public that looks in these ordinances, like Mr. Bluffalow said, Mr. Bluffalow said, if you're just a general a developer from another town or another state and you're just looking at a subdivision ordinance, you don't see any of this stuff. You don't know there's a such thing as a standards and specs or a threshold in our fire code. So it's just referencing it. And at some point they would get it from us anyway, but I think it'd be prudent um, to, to at least mention these and reference them, reference them in our codes. But you said there'll be appendices, right? Yeah, so there are appendices that you guys already adopted in the fire code. So the only thing I'm talking about with cross-referencing is just basically saying in the street section, secondary entrances as enforced by Appendix B in the fire code. Yeah, it's just a cross-reference. So when they need to talk about the compliance with it, they know to go to the fire department. The only thing I'm talking about with this is just referencing a section so you know that streets are required to be the NCDOT standards as required by standards and specs. Things of that nature. It's just cross-referencing because in my zoning ordinance and my subdivision ordinance, there's no mention of any of these codes of any kind. You're just plugging them into Just the plugging them in. I'm That's not putting the code in it. I'm just plugging a reference. Yeah, they're yeah. not there. It, yeah. it makes it, it's probably more user-friendly. It makes it easier. Oh, for it does. Because yeah. Yeah. when I read the subdivision ordinance, I had to go back and look through all three of these, and I'm not even a developer. Yeah, I heard you well. say that. So, yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. All right. Mr. Chancellor. Yes, sir. Some of these secondary streets and the main streets like through subdivisions and well, I'll take mine for for instance. We have two or three different ways to get in my subdivision, but when they started the new addition, what's it called? I don't even know what it's called, beside of me. Uh, Valley Inn. Valley Inn. <clears throat> they did not put Applegate or the streets in that subdivision up to our standards. And now we can't adopt them, is that correct? We haven't adopted them. Applegate is a, yeah, that's a different it's beast. Not that's not in the town. Uh, Applegate's, the, the, it, if you turn off of Camden, that portion at Camden and Applegate all the way up to the first house on your left, when you, right before you turn, uh, make that right turn. At the church. Yeah, that at, right when you pass that church, that's the beginning of the town limits. So right. the majority of Applegate is not in the town. All now, of Applegate. <laughs> now, when you're talking about Valley Inn, a developer is only required to build the new streets in their subdivision up to town standards. Now, they connect it to an existing street, but they're only on the hook on, uh, for the streets that they um, build in the new subdivision. 
Um, so that we don't have, I don't have the authority to attack Applegate through the development right. of the expansion of Valley Inn, but I know I'm aware of the issue. The back section is not up to, to our standards, are they? To my Valley Inn? Yes. Now Valley M, not Valley M one. Um, that's where I, we actually had to do that. When I got here, um, our current public works director had a two-year-old email five years ago of non-response. Um, so as soon as I walked in the door, I held all held up all residential construction in Valley M one. Streets got accepted about four or five months later. Um, that's the system of checks and balances that we have. Yeah, one is the new phase that's in that that is beside you isn't. They're getting close. Don and I have had conversations. He back there smiling because they, they only got one or two houses left. So the only reason why the 75 percent rule hadn't kicked in is they don't have another phase to go to. But it is on our radar in terms of the uh, streets that uh, need to be accepted because phase two hasn't as of yet. But we definitely have phase one. Now, what happens that the developer takes a gamble if you don't do this stuff in a timely fashion? What happened that they had to do to phase one? They had to spend about sixty thousand dollars because had they uh, given it, the streets over to the town, it's on us. Four years after those streets have deteriorated, deteriorated, and they may not have been built to DLT standards. Now they got a punch list from public works you got to bring all this stuff up to standards and then you get it accepted and until that happens you're not getting another permit um from a residence so we have that and we actually had to do that with that subdivision um but so that's why i said we do have the system of checks and balances um but um phase two is on our radar in terms of uh, street I acceptance think that the initial plan was on across that field has come out on Camden Road. But a lot of that has changed, and I don't know the complete status of it. You guys probably know better than I do, because Miss Johnson has passed away. Yeah. And I understand that the developers have an agreement with, the, with her, but I don't know how enforceable that is. Uh, with her being passed away, that may be, remain a field forever. Who knows? There's some conversations, um, not nothing too concrete as of right now, but uh, some conversations. But we need another entrance up there. You go in that way most of the time. You know, you know right now you have two. You have the Mission Hill entrance off Yates Ranch, and then you have the Brentonwood entrance right beside your house. Um, but you're going through an existing neighborhood to get there. But back to Applegate, Applegate, uh, the majority of the issue with Applegate is ours. Um, so that's just a conundrum. Ms. But Adams, um, she has a choice of different ways she can go into her place. But although we have three, four, really, you go through Timberlake. But those streets are all used so heavily that uh, I mean, inside the Applegate now has got big holes in it like that, and. Uh, I don't know what we're going to do about it because it belongs to, who knows? To the county, technically. Well, we need to get them out there to patch it. <laughs> so I just, if they're going to build more next door to me, I hope they hurry up so we can get another entrance up there to take the workload off. But um, um, back to subdivisions, um, what I'd like for you guys to do, um, take some of this stuff home. I can send you copies of the PowerPoint. and throw everything that you possibly can I, I don't i don't want anyone to think that anything is off the table come up with a, an issue that you want to see me um address and let's come up with the language whether it's a uh, hybrid of a the three-letter word <laughs> three -letter acronym but whatever it is i'm good with the let's hybrid. let's let's let's, <laughs> let's list what the issue is and let's find a way to address it i do think there are some things that we can do um, I do think there are some things that we should do, but um, I definitely want to do a little bit more than probably what I have. some things in here that we can take out of here. You know, I, as I look through this, I think that there might be some things that we'll put in here that now we're kind of redundant. Yeah. We could, you know, we could take out. So that's why that's the other thing is I think we we need to we've changed so much. 
Mm-hmm. And we've since this was done in 2009, look how much we've changed. Yeah. I think sidewalks are good. I think yeah. we're good with sidewalks. Yeah. I think we're good with the threshold at, um, for sidewalks. But if there's anything else that you guys want me to, uh, to address, um, and like I said, we can have um, – definitely more work sessions i do want a specific work session on green growth and on um, storm water um but um take the stuff home digest it send me email give me a call um but let me know if there's some other areas that you want me to bring back some some language on or at least try to work through mm-hmm. i'm going to talk to dan about the general statute piece because the parks and rec open space is driven by general statute. I did not realize that. Um, so I want to find out what we can do to it and what we can't do. But my main issue with it is I just do not like the ability of a developer just to pay money as an option of not putting in a park. Um, and then I think as a, as a resident, I think they, they should be concerned because of that, that housing area is what am I getting for it? You know, yeah. in other words, because you think about it, and I'm just using those those that are far away, you know, because if you're if you're you can't make it up here, it, it would be nice for it to be close enough to you. And, and in some are in some cases, like um, the ones over there next to John Griffin Middle School. I mean, I can't even imagine. You think about where they are. Compared but if you to if the, you think about it, we when have. we say park, we're not talking about something this yeah. size. We're not talking about baseball fields. We're talking two lots yeah. and playground equipment and a clubhouse and a pool. Mm-hmm. That's when when I say park, that's what we're talking about. So we're not talking about coming into a hundred and forty lot subdivision, putting in a seven acre complex. Well, we're just saying it. something that enhances the subdivision to where it's a small pocket of area that is recreational in use. And, then, and I like the fact that you let it be tied to the homeowners association. So it's one of my benefits for paying my homeowners fees. Exactly. I think that would be a. a a perk mm-hmm. there, mm-hmm. you know, because you, you're paying fees. What are you getting for them? Just like you said, you know, there's not, so I think that would be a good thing too. And I do believe, just like we suggested, if we could pull the appearance committee in mm-hmm. and then parks, parks and, and rec yeah. to look at those sections that are particular to them, just to get some more ideas, I think that would be a good now, thing. Now, what I may do before the next work session, I can uh, start and maybe have some sub committee meetings mm-hmm. where I can take this to the appearance committee and get that feedback from them. I can take it to Parks and Rec get that feedback from them. So what I'm bringing back to you guys is what they gave me as opposed to us trying to work that out yeah. in here. So That's I can talk idea. to uh, LaMarco and uh, the appearance committee and get on their agenda at their next meeting and have the conversation. And I think they'd appreciate it too that we're coming to them saying, hey, we're making some changes to our subdivision. We want to get some feedback specifically on plant lists and things of that nature um, because I'm, I know Mrs. Bailey probably has specific species of plants that she probably more prefer. I know we can reference the North Carolina um, list of plants, but I'd like to see if there's an official plant list that you guys want to develop for Hope Mills where we list certain types of trees that you want to have here to create that uniformity and that standard that we're looking for. And I think one more thing that I think has come out of this, just to kind of recap, and that would be that because we now feel that we have hired people who are, have our expertise their expertise is in these different areas Mm -hmm. that then when something is brought to us at those final stages that I can see how it could be put on consent agenda because you know we can trust that that uh, Mr. Cisco has looked at it that Ms. Brown's looked at it that all the pieces have been taken care of and there's not one of us up here with well I guess with exception Commissioner Legg worked in construction but the rest of us our expertise would not would be limited where you've had everybody look yeah. at it mm-hmm. and I think that's that would be a good thing and then because we can't reinvent something because it's what we like mm-hmm. that's yeah. the, the power of thing about um, Dr. McCray's um, Mayor Patel McCray's um, point I'd love for you guys to come to a sketch plan like it, it really you'll really get a chance to see how we get really deep into the nuts and bolts of every aspect of this development so that you feel more comfortable when it appears before you we actually have vetted this pretty thoroughly well, i think that would be we could just rotate an invitation yeah. to each member 
and I'll, and I'll uh, funnel the, the projects yeah. to her because some of them are just generic stuff. I mean, you're not really getting any value. But if it's a sketch plan that we set in, a sketch plan is usually only called when it's a development of that magnitude where they actually need to get feedback from everybody. Usually it's just somebody wanting to get a zoning um some zoning regulations but if it's uh, one of those 80 lot subdivisions or if it's one of those 70 acre industrial developments they want to sit down um the uh murphy U murphy uh oil usa was a perfect example they came from atlanta it's about um we did a zoom meeting we did an in-person meeting um but they really wanted to know every single aspect and we sit down, there's no time limit. We really just go through every part of the code. But I think that's a great exercise for you guys to, um, to witness, um, to get an idea of how um, deep these conversations go. Okay. Madam Yes. I do have one more thing. Yes, yeah, you. Do you have like some best practices or some places or some subdivision ordinances that we can look at? So, like, you're giving me the example of Circle K in one area and the other one. I, I, like, I need to see something like that. So instead of me like looking at the words, if I see, if I go to somebody's subdivision ordinance or you have something where I can see this is how it looks with five trees and this is how it looks yeah. with three. Yeah, I put that, I, 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 I can put, definitely put that together. The example was was just the Circle K. Um, some of them will be visual, some of them is ordinance related. Um, but that's what I do before I bring something to you guys. I'm looking at Aberdeen, I'm looking at Southern Pines, I'm looking at Fayetteville. Mm -hmm. Um, I try not to go to the larger cities because yeah. what you're dealing with in Greensboro and Charlotte is going to be completely yeah. different than yeah. what you. Fayetteville is the bigger sister city we're trying to grow to, but I'll call Holly Springs, I'll call Cary, I'll get yeah. different yeah. municipalities Cary, Cary has a nice one. to see what are they doing that's a little bit more creative and what can we do to tweak it to work here. Sometimes it will, sometimes it won't. But if I find something that does work, that's the example you're looking for. Yeah. And if you want to look at a comparison of uh, our uh, development in Hope Mills that was two different developers did it and two different sets of regulations. If you go look at Fox Meadow and Brook Ridge, Ooh. Fox Meadow, when it was done, there's sidewalks, there's uh, street lights, there's everybody's mailbox matches. Now their stormwater piece was is not was there's been some issues, but that was because they were developed before the stormwater priorities were in place. But if you go down and look in the bottom side of that, you'll see that they're they're missing so many of those pieces, and that's because it came in at a different time. And that's where you can see evidence there of how our ordinances have changed. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think that's important too, because you can see the improvements that have been made from you know from. Most recently, mm -hmm. but I'll put together. Um, we stay here, and we learn from development. Uh, we made a mistake here. Yeah, let's don't do it again. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's the reason I think it's very important that that Dan had the chance to look all of this over before it's ever mm -hmm. ever voted on to to be an ordinance. Let him review everything. Of course, I know he does anyway. But be very good there but um i can come up with um a packet um some of them may be uh ordinance um other ordinances that you can look at and some of them may be locations and things mm -hmm. i want you guys to go visit but i'll put that together together for you okay. now question before we uh wrap do you guys have a date you want me to come back um i would probably need uh time to at least get on the agenda for the parents and talk to lamarco but um i mean that won't take forever um, you want to shoot for October? Mid October? Yeah. Maybe the, the first meeting in October, we can do it five Yeah. I'd be perfect because we only got one in September, right? Yeah. yeah. yeah that first meeting in October. Many meetings are usually the later mm -hmm. in March. So that gives me a chance to get on the schedule and then be able to incorporate that. Yeah. I think that'd be great. And if need be, it could be the second meeting in October. We'll shoot yeah. for the first meeting, but if for whatever reason the, you can't get it by that first meeting in October, then the second meeting okay. in October, but that would be perfect. And then do a five o'clock meeting yep. like yeah. we've done here. And any suggestions, ideas you guys have in between now and then, um, send and them my way. If we did it by email, that way you've, yeah. got, you've got something. And if we call you, we pass you and we say something, but I think if you send an email to uh, to Mr. McLaughlin and to Melissa with or Miss Adams with your concerns or maybe something you want them to look at, um, then that way you've got it in front of you and then you you'll 
have a list of because yeah. because I the, the whole point I'm trying to make I have ideas that I think work but I want to get an assignment of something you want me to look yeah. into to add to what what things I've come up with for my philosophy this is a good That's start point Jasper. Hmm? this is a good start point yeah Mm-hmm. Today I wanted this to be a, a, a springboard yeah. to move forward. It I is. think we did accomplish that. Okay. All right. Thanks. Anything else? If not, then do we have a motion to adjourn this meeting, Madam this Mayor, work session? First of all, I'd like to apologize for my phone ringing a while ago. I have a brother who had a stroke in Ohio today. I just forgot to turn it off. Please excuse me. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Adjourn.